and then we'll do it again. Absolutely love that clip. Jim Reeves was a perfectionist. Uh, just I'm sure to hear your mind too. It sounds, it sounds great. Uh, but Jim wanted it better. Uh, also, you see, in wearing a suit into the studio, that was normal. They treated this as business. Uh, I can tell you, working uh, with some of the families and, and, and for some of the musicians around, um, they didn't countenance foolish behavior. Uh, I can, uh, I had one particular story, I was talking with a daughter of a cellist, a uh, cellist named Byron Bach. And the daughter said, really, one of the only sessions that her dad ever talked about at the dinner table was a Jerry Lee Lewis session where Jerry showed up. Obviously, not in his right mind, raised a ruckus, and the musicians just packed up and left. They didn't tolerate that sort of thing. So, this was business. This was not, um, you know, not foolish time, but they had fun. Now, to Charlie, where does Charlie fit in all of this? Well, uh, this is 1940, before 1941. It's a picture taken uh, when he is but a small child, and he does not care to be a session musician in Nashville because that job doesn't exist yet. but I can stand the usual spot in St. Louis Cardinals did. He was a big baseball fan as a kid, right here in West Virginia. Born and raised in, uh, in the Oak Hill Fayetteville area, born in Oak Hill. His family actually uh, was friends with the family that uh, attended to the body of Hank Williams, uh, who died in Oak Hill. And then he lived in Fayetteville for a sizable portion of his young life. His parents divorced uh, when he was still in elementary school, and he then spends his year bouncing back and forth, summers up here, and then winter school year down in the Miami area. It turns out that being in South Florida was very good for him for a number of reasons. He was an asthmatic, and so the, the air down there was better for him uh, than it was up here. Uh, although at that time, the, the, the cold was still going really strong in the river. Uh, the River Valley. It also was very important that he was down there because they had cool music stuff happening in Miami. Progressive music education, and his parents really supported that. Uh, his mother bought his first harmonica for him for 50 cents and a box top and some title of the book. Uh, it was an ad. He had a comic book. He doesn't remember the title of the comic book, although some of us wish that he did. But he found a coupon, he clipped it out, sent it in, and they got a harmonica with a little instruction book. He says that by the time he had about a week, he learned all the tunes of the instruction book and his mother had sent him outside to play. Uh, he also learned how to play the guitar, started learning how to play the guitar, and it wasn't too terribly long before he even convinced his father to buy him a state-of-the-art, top-of-the-line, Les Paul Black custom guitar with the Dixie Dremolo down there. As a uh, about 14-year-old Charlie McCoy uh, with a nice promo picture. At this point, Charlie, as a young teen, is playing in a barn dance program in Miami, uh, where his job is to provide 10 minutes of rock and roll music for every hour of entertainment. The old timers would do the country dancing for 50 minutes, but the young people needed 10 minutes of rock and roll. So Charlie was there playing Chuck Berry, and he was playing the best Chicago blues that he could learn off of WLAC out of Nashville, and some records that he was uh, getting through Randy's record shop in Nashville as well. He's getting all of that shit to it. Back behind that picture of him with that guitar is his high school music theory homework. He took a very progressive music theory course uh, that was offered to students at his high school, and uh, he still kept his part writing homework, most of his part of ours, uh, but he kept his, and uh, he's very proud of it. There's a nice picture of him down in the lower uh, right of the screen, conducting the choir. He was thoroughly trained in the classical model. He was, he was set up, he you know, knows how to read music, uh, he understands part writing, he understands conducting, he understands the instruments, and that helped him get into the University of Miami, where he was a student for one year. He was a music education major, uh, and as a part of that, and then he learned to play a lot of different instruments. And as part of the gig, he's learning to play as many instruments as possible. Uh, unfortunately, this was 19, 1960, uh, 1959, and schools of music were not terribly progressive at that point in time. Charlie was playing rock and roll music. They didn't care for rock and roll music. They had signs up in the school of music not to play jazz in the practice rooms. And so one day, his, the, the dean of the college and the school of music pulls him into his office and says, hey, Mr. McCoy, why don't you give up that rock and roll music and, and really focus on your studies? And Charlie says, well, I have to play the music, the rock and roll music to pay for my tuition. And he's, the dean says, well, 
if you got better on the, on the base, we could give you a scholarship. Charlie said, I don't think I can get better on the orchestral base. It's, it's not an easy instrument. It's not something I'm capable of doing. I'm going to keep playing rock and roll. The dean says, now go away. And so Charlie dropped out after a year of music education uh, at the University of Miami. Now that sounds really sad, uh, but he didn't really seem to be faced by it because he had a buddy named Mel Tillis, a you know, connection named Mel Tillis. He said, why don't you come up to, to Nashville and auditions, I get your auditions. That sounds fun. So he goes up his auditions, uh, he auditions for Chet Atkins and for Owen Bradley, plays some Chuck Berry, they don't like him. They don't want any rock and roll music here. They don't know what to do with him. But Owen Bradley invites him to a session. He says, why don't you come watch a recording session? Charlie says, I don't know what the session is, but sure, I'll show up. So he gets there the next morning, goes to the Kwanzaa Hut. There's a staircase there. That they say, just climb up about halfway and watch what happens. And in walks this group of, as he says, old men. They were men in their 20s. Uh, but Charlie was 19. Uh, these old men walk in, and then in walks a 13-year-old girl named Brenda Lee. And he says, I don't know what in the world these old men are going to do with this little girl, but it can't be anything good. <laughs> they start playing, and it's magic. Charlie says at that moment, he wanted, he wanted to be a session musician. So you know, he has to go back home, finds his way back to, uh, to Nashville, thankfully around 1961. Uh, and begins his career as a session player. Now, as I said, Charlie's a music ed major, so that means he plays lots of things. And I'm going to play you a few examples that give you a sense of the breadth of his contributions to American popular music. Uh, his first major recording session uh, for a major label was for RCA, 1961. Uh, it's a fun story. He gets to, he, when he gets to Nashville, he starts recording demos for this guy named Jim Denny, who owns Cedarwood Publishing. Major uh, song publisher in Nashville. And you know, they play these songs to the publishing company that's their job is to get an artist or a song connected so they can make money on it. Well, this demo that Charlie played on finds its way to Chet Atkins, who was putting things together for this new singer and Margaret. And Chet Atkins hears this harmonica play that Charlie was doing and says, I need that on the record. So he calls up Jim Denny and says, Get me the guy who played on the demo. Here comes Charlie McCoy. Charlie's 20 years old, walks into the room with established session musicians, and is asked to lay down exactly what he played before. What comes out is one of the, probably the, I think, the strongest tracks on Ann Margaret's debut album, a song called I Just Don't Understand. <laughs> Charlie, are you sure? 
He says, I played on that record. I played very sexy. Listen, you might not be able to hear it here, but I can assure you, duh, duh. he's in there playing along. Roy Orbison, uh, the lead guitar part here also is by a West Virginia musician, Wayne Moss, uh, from South Charleston. Story how he gets in with Dylan. Charlie McCoy is best known for his work with Bob Dylan. Personally, I tell you, Charlie doesn't care about Dylan much at all, but everybody thinks he should. Uh, he, he gets called for Dylan tribute concerts, he gets called for Dylan panels. But Dylan wasn't a great musician in his life. He isn't a great musician. He goes, I don't understand that. Um, but so uh, his connection with Dylan was through a fellow named Bob Johnston. Bob Johnson was a younger record producer, was trying to get started uh, with Columbia Records. He had this artist, Bob Dylan, who was kind of going through a transition period. Uh, Johnston had told Charlie at one point, hey, if you're ever in New York, give me a call. Uh, I'll get you tickets to a ball game or a show or something like that. So Charlie has his family up for the World's Fair. And, and they say, he calls up, hey, Bob, can you give me tickets to the Mets game or something, right? Give um, me tickets. Bob says, sure. Why don't you come by the studio? I got this guy watching me. So Charlie says, sure. Comes to the studio, and there's Bob Dylan. And most people are genuflecting at this point. Charlie goes, it's another singer. And so what ends up happening is Bob's running down this new song. It's called Desolation Row. And he says, hey, why don't you grab this other guitar and play lead while I sing it? Charlie plays lead all the way through it. In the style of Grady Martin, who played guitar on El Paso, Marty Robbins is famous for out in the West Texas town of Bell, all that lovely guitar work. There's Charlie, right, playing the same style, doing his best Grady Martin ripoff for, for Dylan. This is 65. 66, Johnston says, We're going to bring Dylan to Nashville, and we're going to hire musicians from Nashville to make this great record, right? It's going to be powerful, and landmark, and amazing, and clean. And Charlie's the band leader. So Charlie hires all the musicians that go into Columbia Studio B. Charlie told me, it's not in the book, because he told me after the book was published. Uh, they just recently told me that they put him, in, put him in Columbia B because no country musician liked recording in there. And Dylan could just have it for as long as he wanted it. Nobody in Nashville cared who Bob Dylan was. Stick in the group nobody wants, right? And so over the course of several days, they put together this album, Blonde on Blonde. The tune that everybody knows is one that was recorded very late at night, Rainy Day Women, number 12 and 35. And this was one of these tunes. Dylan, many of the songs on this session, I went to, went to New York and listened to the Raw session tapes uh, as part of this project. Dylan didn't have lyrics sometimes, he didn't have arrangements. There were a couple of tunes where they actually did two radically different arrangements of the song. Uh, and Charlie's the band leader, he's come up with a lot of these ideas. Late night, one night, decide we're going to do this song, Rainy Day Women. Really want it to sound like a Salvation Army band. Charlie says, Cool, I know this trombone player. So he calls his trombone player, but they say, Hey, you doing anything? Come on into the, the studio. It's like 11 o'clock at night. Charlie gets a trumpet, music get major. And together, they come up with the iconic uh, Salvation Army style band. It's on Rainy Day Women. This is not Charlie McCoy playing the harmonica. Charlie would beg me to tell you that. This is Dylan sounding really bad. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie's best work is with country singers who were 
really good at, at picking songs or in some cases writing their own songs that have very powerful lyrics that would leave the room for an instrumentalist to jump in and provide some emotional support. To me, a great example of that comes from Tom T. Hall, a great songwriter uh, with some fun and interesting West Virginia connections, uh, is recording Old Dogs, Children of Watermelon and Wine, which features Charlie offering the opening hook, the part that DJs talk over. This is Charlie McCoy playing lead. And what you'll hear is he's giving up that kind of bluesy sound. I mean, you can still play that sound. That sound. But on these kinds of records, he's playing with a very pure, almost crystalline kind of harmonica sound that works to just kind of make it sound plaintive, right? I always think of a droopy dog. I have acid down, so I think it's kind of droopy dog, plaintive sad. That's what Charlie's good at doing. Which in country music works really well. How old do you think I am? I said, Well, I didn't know. He said, I turned sixty five about eleven months ago. In Miami, pouring wind to the sea down. When this old gray white gentleman was cleaning up the line, there wasn't anyone around. And you hear the string pad, that is the Nashville sound. Those all Nashville symphony players. So that's Charlie's a session musician. But the book also talks about some other aspects of his career that are a little less known. For instance, this is Charlie's a rock and roll musician. He's the bass player over here with Charlie McCoy and the escort. He's the lead vocalist. You'll hear it just a second here. So you can still go there. Uh, that's a photo I took 
Orleans. In the neighborhood where Charlie started playing baseball, uh, his second boyhood home was right over there. Uh, over here on the right is a great picture of, uh, I think, the, the 2015 West Virginia Music Hall of Fame inductions, where he is, uh, Charlie is the guy on the right, inducting Russ Hicks, a great pedal steel guitar player uh, in the West Virginia Music Hall of Fame. And then, of course, down there in the bottom right, uh, the bottom left is Today we gave him an honorary doctor here at WBU uh, in May of 2016, because we do call him Dr. Charlie McCoy here. Uh, I know that, that was a lot in a nutshell. Charlie continues to amaze me. Uh, I feel very blessed to, to be able to, to call him a friend and, and a pal, and that he emails me and calls me about things. Um, but he continues to amaze me. He works with musicians in their 20s, he works with musicians in their 80s, and he treats everybody in the studio like they're old friends. I've watched him do it, and it amazes me every time. Anytime somebody wants an interview, he says yes. He, but he's recorded with 70 country music hall of famers. There are only 130 some in the hall of fame. Right? We did the math when we were in Nashville together the last time. It's a lot of folks. Not a single person. And I, normally, like this is an ethnographic transparency here, right? Normally, when you do a project like this, you're going to hear somebody say something bad about something. It's inevitable. Never once with this guy. Charlie McCoy is beloved by everyone in Nashville, everybody who's ever worked with him, everybody who's ever shown how a G harmonica works. They love the man. And I feel very, very fortunate that I get to spend time telling his story. So thank you all very much. I'm happy to have an answer to questions you may have. Answer. That's where she's from. Nancy Klein was from Winchester. People in Winchester would not let you know that. Uh, they, they, don't, they can't stand her. Honestly, was just within the last decade or so, there was an effort to name a street after her. And the church groups got together and tried to stop it. Now, the only the street named after her that Nancy Klein is named after, vice versa, is uh, an access road to a Lowe's. Um, because, yeah, because uh, Patsy was known as kind of a rough and tumble, you know, hard drinking, hard cussing kind of gal in Winchester. And that legacy is still there. Um, so they like applesauce and apple blossoms, but they don't care to tell you that Patsy finds one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, maybe she has a I didn't talk to Dylan. I went to Dylan's. I went to Dylan's office and I talked to him. And I was in. I was in his conference room. And there was a phone that said, "You know, push this button for Bob." I didn't. Um, but in reading, so in Chronicles Volume One, the, the the Dylan book, he does not talk kindly about Nashville. Uh, and he says, "I don't know why they essentially. I don't know why they sent me down there. All of their songs were about guys with slug lives." I remember his read this book this week and uh, again, whoa! <laughs> so no, I didn't talk to Dylan. Um, but... It's interesting, Charlie. Well, a lot of people didn't have great things to say about Dylan. Here's what Dylan did for Nashville. I will say there's a great exhibit if you're in Nashville, go to the Country Music Hall of Fame, see Dylan Cash and the Nashville Cats. It's a beautiful exhibit that goes into a lot of detail. Everyone there will tell you Dylan brought jobs. Because when Dylan came to Nashville, everybody who thought Dylan was God wanted to go where he went. And so it opened up and they ended up building new studios in Nashville and more session musicians got work. It was a boom time for them. But if you talk to anybody who worked with Dylan and you really get them talking, no. Wayne Moss just told me on the record that Dylan is the only person who ever fired him from a session. Because during one of the sessions, I think it was blonde on one, but don't quote me on that, um, Dylan was working out some lyrics. It's taken forever. And these guys were used to cutting four songs in three hours. And they were spending six, seven, eight hours in a session getting two songs done. Wayne Moss is sitting on, on a couch writing his own material. Dylan goes to his right hand man and says, I want that guy gone. The only time Wayne's ever been fired from a session, 50 some odd years of playing sessions. Right? So Dylan, Dylan brought a lot of work, but Dylan's not a favorite person there. Young people love him. The Americana set, anybody in the whole country, Americana, they think he's fantastic. Um, but ask the folks who work with this. I was just going to point out that they're interested in the relationship between Charlie and Dylan. 
Definitely worth checking out because they, they do a lot of these sorts of you know, Dylan, you know, celebrations and things. And, and the country music call thing just had one that was really solid. I just have kind of a general question about the difference between recording then and digital recording now. And I love that Jim Reeves footage where, you know, you're, you're, what you're getting on the record is what they did. And I wonder if that's still the case today or they digitally edit and manipulate the thing so that you're not listening to a performance. Right. You're listening to a compilation of little cuts and clips and tweaks and raising things off pitch yep. and all like that. So yes. it's, it's so far removed from the performance. Digital technology is big in Nashville. It's, it, it, I'll preface all this really quickly by saying Nashville works on efficiency. You make money on a record by not being in the studio forever. The session musicians were in part you know, one of those compromises. If you brought the road band in, they would not give you a good recording and in most cases, and so we didn't use them. It was like that, right? Digital technology is supposed to make that also the case. But Charlie's told me on many occasions that he finds it really troubling sometimes to walk into a, a digital studio with younger producers who are willing to allow lots of stuff to happen and then edit it later. So he'll show up and they will be playing the track to he's supposed to play the harmonic on something and they'll, they'll say, well, well, just play over the whole song. Well, we'll fix it later. Charlie grew up in an environment where Grady Martin pulled him aside one time and said, listen to the lyrics and don't play where they're singing, right? So musically, there's some real challenges there for, for some of the older musicians who are still active there. I will also say though, there's a really great scene of hip younger producers we're going back to the old ways of more direct to this. They use digital technology, but they don't uh, use it to snip and splice some things. Uh, it was, when I was just in Nashville last, I went with Charlie to a session, uh, and it was a bunch of guys in their 20s doing what sounded like 1960s country production, and it was live in a room as much as possible. A lot of, a lot of life to that sound. Uh, yeah. What do you musicians like Charlie Good question. Does it go to family members usually? Does it go to libraries? Or specialized collections? Right. So that's been a real, a real challenge with this research project. Some of the materials are at the Country Music Hall of Fame and the museum. And I can go there and get access to it. It's not much of a problem. Um, some of these are, some of those materials are also at the uh, Center for Popular Music in Middle Tennessee State. Those are kind of the two big uh, national oriented archives. But there's an awful lot of stuff in people's houses and people's homes. I have ledgers from that cello player I was telling you about. Um, one of his daughters is an accountant, so she kept his business papers when he passed. And so one day I get this package in the mail, and it's three years of his complete financial records. Every gig he played, every session he did, with holdings, carnage. He was a cellist, so they paid him extra to drag his instrument. I have very detailed records with his family stuff. Um, one of the examples of fun one. Uh, there's an arranger that I worked with, his name's Bourbon White. He did string arrangements for everybody. And Oak Ridge Boys was one of his big, his big groups later on. Um, he decided he didn't want to store the stuff anymore. He had all these scores just sitting around. So he throws most of them out, except enough to wallpaper his bathroom on the downstairs level of his house. He says he'd been through like three wives. Uh, and he says, you know, every wife I got wanted a new bathroom. I decided at this point I was just going to do it my way. And so I actually set up an appointment to go to his bathroom. <laughs> it was fun, you know. I, we, we chatted for a couple of hours, but the main purpose was to go look at his bathroom. Uh, it's really, it's not because it's really troubling what's been lost. Uh, and then there's some also things the, the technical materials, you know, the, 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 in terms of wiring and, and the microphones and those sorts of things that a lot of that has been stolen and stripped as studios have closed and reopened. Uh, but I just spent some time back in May at RCAD with their studio manager, climbing through closets and things, trying to find how signals were patched from different mic ones. Yeah, and it was fun, uh, but it's a very different kind of archive than what I'm used to working. 
Well, thank you all for being here. Thanks again to Sally for setting this up. And uh, I believe there are goodies to be eaten and books to be purchased. So please do uh, partake of all of those. Thank you so much.